before you drink. Life. Life. The story that this person in their head. It's not about being perfect. So radically different than my story. Welcome to Train for Life, a podcast brought to you by ISI Elite Training. I'm Adam Rice, founder and CEO, and we'll be hosting this alongside Amanda Hall, our COO. Tune in weekly as we explore topics on personal and professional development to help you level up in all aspects of your life. We call this Training for Life. Welcome back, guys. So we're excited today to welcome our next guest to the Train for Life podcast, Mr. Mac Brock is a singer, songwriter, worship leader, devoted husband, and father. After embarking into ministry over 15 years ago, Mac now travels the world using his gift of music to impact the lives of people all over. Help us welcome Mac to the show. Thanks for joining, man. Welcome, welcome. Good to be here. We're excited to meet you. Yes. Um, tell us a little bit. Let's just kick it off. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your family. Yeah, um, so... Uh, I've got, I'm, I'm a devoted husband, as he said. I, yes. like, I like the uh, prerequisite of <laughs> devoted. Um, yeah, I've got three kids. Uh, my son, Harvey, is 10. Got a little girl named Cyrus, who is seven. And then we have a foster son, uh, Z, who is two. Wow. Yeah. You're busy. So we got a full house. It is uh, chaotic in all the good ways. That's awesome. Yeah. And you guys live here in Charlotte? We live in Charlotte. We've been, we've been in Charlotte for like the last 15 years. We wow. love it here. So tell us a little bit about, um, obviously, you're an artist. Talk a little bit about kind of what's happening in your, in your land of that currently. Yeah, so I am a worship leader. Uh, and it's so funny. I'm in this space where I'm like, like you say, like an artist, musician that travels. But at my core, at my heart, like I'm just a worship leader, I'm like a oh. church person that uh, loves to be at church and loves to like lead people into worship. That's kind of my heart. That's my calling. Um, and so that's, you know, what I've been doing for most of my life. My dad's a pastor, grew up in the church and uh, have been, I don't know, leading worship since I was like in high school. And wow. so, yeah, I'm still doing it. That's amazing. Tell us a little bit. You mentioned that your youngest is, um, a, is a foster child. So yeah. Tell us a little bit about how that journey has impacted you and, and your wife and your family. Yeah, so we um, we got licensed to foster right when the pandemic hit. And so we were kind of like in the process to, you know, you have to go through like a long training, yeah. all these courses and all this stuff. Uh, and, and we got Z like three months into quarantine. And he's been with <laughs> us since then for the, like the last two years. And I think for me i was very much not into the idea <laughs> uh, like adoption fostering was always something that was on my wife's heart and me being like a very selfish person was not didn't want to disrupt my life like that yeah. uh but well, you, you have like a 10 and a seven year old <laughs> and now you introduce a two-year-old right. like, i'm oh. like no i'm good like, like I, you things know, are good I, right yeah, now yeah, i'm like fine i like to have like my time and uh no, but my wife, it was on her heart, and I kind of committed to, well, I'll read up about it. And then after I read up about it, I was like, okay, well, I'll commit to um, taking the classes, or I'll commit to doing the training. And kind of through all those like little yeses, uh, really shifted my whole heart towards uh, just a need for fostering, a need for foster parents, especially in this area. And it just, I don't know, it changed my heart and it changed uh, what I think, like, I guess me and my wife, like the direction of our family. Yeah. And so it's been a really big gift to us uh, since Z has like, come into our life. But it's also been a gift to us to even be able to talk about fostering and, and learn, learn and educate more about like what fostering looks like. Because to me, it was like this big, daunting, scary crazy you know this like this huge crazy thing that was like too heavy to carry and the more I learned about it the more I learned like uh I don't know kind of like what I said before is like saying like little yeses yeah. along yeah. the way and then realizing like this is something that I can do this is something that is like doable and there's a lot of support and we have a lot of help and we have a lot of resources to make this not this like daunting impossible well, task. I think unless you've know someone personally who's done it um 
a lot of people don't talk about the good parts of it. Right. Right. You don't hear some of that. Sometimes you yeah, it's scary. kind scary. Of, you just only see it like what's in like movies and like little orphan Annie. Like yeah. that's what like fostering. <laughs> I thought fostering was like this like chaotic house yeah. with just like all these orphans. And there's just a, I don't know. It's a whole different world. And, and we have some close friends of ours who are foster parents who just even watching them and seeing their process uh, really encouraged us to explore it more. It's amazing. I have a sister. My sister has two daughters from foster and now they're okay. The, they're both uh, graduated college and now the youngest gra just graduated high school. Wow. But it's amazing to see yeah. how quickly the family unit forms around that, especially if you have the right support system, I think, yeah, you know, that's amazing. To outside of it. But yeah, it, yeah, that's interesting, that journey. And I think it's really commendable that you're up, up front to say, I wasn't really on board with this. Yeah, it was so scary to me. a lot to of me. people feel that way. Yeah, I was, uh, I was like terrified of it. Mm. Wow. Take, take us back to entering into music. So were you always into, into music and then for to provide context, so you were what 2007? Is that right? The the worship leader at yeah, that's at when Elevation I first moved to Charlotte to uh, kind of help start uh, Elevation Worship, and you know that church, the Elevation Church was like early on in uh, its like infancy then, and me and a couple of other worship leaders moved up to kind of help build that worship ministry. And you were so you were the worship. I mean, you wrote or co-wrote some of the most famous songs. And I guess I have a heart for it because that's where we go to church. We, yeah. go, we go to Ballantyne and me and my wife have really found a home there. Um, so it was cool to, to have you here because the, fr the fruit of what you put so many years into is, is got to be blowing your mind right yeah. now. Um, it's special. It's it really is. cool to, to look back and see. And say, yeah, I was a part of that. Yeah. So when you, what led you kind of what introduced you and how did you get into elevation? Then I want to talk about kind of what led you to going out on your own and, and where did you feel called to do that? Yeah. So, like I said, I kind of grew up in the church or grew up. My dad's a pastor. My mom's a musician. She's a drummer. She still plays drums That's at my cool. dad's really? church cool. every weekend. She's <laughs> awesome. She's the best. Uh, so I kind of grew up just around music yeah. and around even like church music and worship. And I was leading at an event that uh, Stephen Furtick was preaching at. And it was like right when he first started Elevation or he, he was telling me, he was like, we're about to plant this church in Charlotte. Um, we're so excited about it. And we just kind of kept in touch over the next year. And then about a year later, I started just driving up to Charlotte. I was living in South Carolina at the time and I would lead, you know, worship in the mornings in Charlotte and then come home and lead worship at my church in Columbia that night. And then about six months later, me and my wife decided to move up to Charlotte to like really dive in. And uh, I was on staff with the church for a decade. That's awesome. Yeah. And so you were, I mean, you went through the, the transition of <clears throat> when you started, you had one, you were launching one location, right? Right. And so when you left, how many locations were there? And what was it oh, like to I see? I don't even know. Yeah. <laughs> it was a lot. Yeah. It's kind of like you guys, yeah. where it's just it's just kind of spreading everywhere. Yeah. What? So you you left, what, in 18? You went on, uh, on your own? 2017. 2017. Yep. So where was it, like, where did God place that that in your heart to, to go out and do that? Like, what did that look like? And then I'm sure there was a level of fear around that. I'm sure there was a level of uncertainty, yeah. doubt, all of that. Or, or was there? Yeah, there definitely was. I mean... Um, y'all can hear from my conversation, like I'm scared of a lot of things, fostering and uh, <laughs> stepping out. Uh, I'm just a fearful guy. Uh, no, I, it definitely was a scary thing. It wasn't a, for us, it wasn't like, Hey, I've always dreamed of being like my own artist or anything like that. Like, so I just want to step out and do my own thing. That was not my heart. Yeah. That wasn't really I grew up playing in bands like I like being yeah. a part of like a group and you know being a part of something that's not just me but we me and my wife just felt kind of like a I don't know impression on our heart that the Lord was like asking us to step away and if you've ever gone through something like that and you where you feel like the Lord might be like telling you something, but you're like, I don't know if this is God or if this is just like, right. <laughs> yes, you know, <laughs> some weird thought in the back of my head. 
Um, so it took a lot of like praying, a lot of like seeking wisdom and, and processing with people that we trusted and, and kind of like spiritual mentors or, or whoever to come to the conclusion that, yeah, like the Lord was just calling us out. We didn't know what he was calling us into next. We didn't know like what the next season was going to be. We just knew like our assignment here is done. Yeah. So you got to step away. Yeah. And so mm-hmm. um, that was definitely a, like a hard decision. But I think anytime you feel like you're being obedient to like a calling on your life, even if it's a difficult decision, you carry a lot of peace in it. Yeah. And so even if it's hard, even if you are scared, there's a peace that kind of transcends all of that. And that's what we felt. Was there, was there a bigger vision or was it really just you felt it was time to do that? Yeah. It's hard to even explain. This is what it was that yeah. like led up to it as, as much as that tugging that we felt. Yeah. A lot of prayer, me and my wife, we, uh, fast a lot. And if yeah. you're in the church world, um, fasting is kind of like where you, you know, you take a break from like eating and you spend time praying in those days. And so anytime like me and my wife go through, uh, big decisions, you know, fostering or yeah. leaving the place that we've spent a decade, you know, building and pouring into, uh, we fasted and prayed and, and ultimately just felt released. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I was literally in the bed last night at 1130 watching. I went down a rabbit hole of fasting. <laughs> and I turn over to my wife and I'm like, hey, will you do this 48 hour water fast? <laughs> really? Like, You're crazy. W- I'm like, here's all the benefits of it. <laughs> yeah, I know we're kind of. Yeah, I, I feel like it's such a good habit. I've never done it. So really? No. Yeah, it's I think it's awesome. I mean, there's a lot of like even like intermittent fasting, like in the yep. fitness world, there's a lot of like yep. positive things about it. But just even fasting, like from a spiritual aspect. It's been so beneficial for me and my wife anytime we've had like big things in our life going on or just stuff that we're praying for. Um, if we like together, yeah, take a day, two days to just like fast and pray. The Lord has always been really generous with like uh, revealing stuff to us, you know, yeah. so it's always been good for us. That's Is your awesome. fast normally just water or? Yeah, usually yeah. it'll be like water. Um yeah, that's for the most part. Like if it's like a 24 hour or 48 hour fast, it'll be like water. Have you ever encouraged your kids to fast with you? We haven't done that yet. Just curious. But even you asking that, I feel like oh, they're, they're probably, at least my son is probably old enough to challenge him to in, do it. <laughs> in yeah. some, some areas like that with us. That's there's cool. something about, there's something about putting yourself in a place where you remove areas that purposely bring you back to why you're fasting to really put that on your heart, whether it's you know, regardless of whether you're doing it through prayer with God or you need some answers or you really want to take some time to meditate on an answer. I don't think a lot of people think about fasting. It's interesting. We were talking with a couple yesterday that is interested in franchising and opening their own ISI. And they were, they said, we've taken today to fast. Yep. Wow. Um, Yeah. And that was really, I mean, it really stuck with me. Yeah. There's something about the, like, I mean, there's so many different ways to fast, you know, sometimes like you can say like, I'm going to like stop watching Netflix for (laughs) for a week, you know, like give up something. But Mm -hmm. I think that there is something special and like biblical about like fasting from food, (laughs) like as a, cause you feel that physical kind of hunger. Yeah. You feel that like your body is telling you like I'm needing something. And when you feel that, and if you like, I don't know, kind of, use that as like a spiritual thing to connect to the Lord and to ask for his kind of provision in that. I don't, there's just something special about that. That's That's awesome. awesome. Yeah. Well, I want to kind of talk a little bit about you went through the process, you stepped away. I mean, you obviously you're still, I, I, you said I'm a worship leader, but you're also an amazing writer and you minister to others in your own way. And you use those gifts, like talk a little bit about how, you know, I think, I think that, for one, I think if you go back to, you know, you and I aren't that far apart in age. So if you go back to being younger and you've said you grew up in the church, you kind of have, you have these gifts, right? I think yeah. sometimes people are figuring out what those gifts are. And if right. you get in the right place, I think you really, whether your gifts are in music or in other forms of creative or leadership um, areas of operation, but 
I think it's really interesting to say, like, I had these gifts, you fostered this, and then you went on your own. Like, how do you, how do you use those gifts? Um, or did you see those gifts as something like later, I really want to do my own thing? Or did it take a while for you to really identify these are the gifts that I want to make my career upon and yeah. move into? It's interesting. I, like I said, I grew up around music. My mom always encouraged me to play music and uh, grew up playing in bands and all this stuff. You know, even as like a kid, I was always singing, yeah. you know, or I was in like plays at school where I'm singing. And so from an early age, I think I knew, OK, this is a skill that I have. And and then when I'm in like high school, it's like, OK, I want to be in a band because that's like cool. So I want to be like a cool kid, <laughs> you know, yeah. like doing that thing. And uh and it's just that kind of repetition, like just doing it over and over and over again and finding like your lane of how you want to do this. And so for me, I learned early on, like I'm, I like leading worship. I like being like, I'm a church person. I like being in church. And, and honestly, for the longest time, even though like I grew up in the church and grew up like leading worship, I didn't want that to be my career. I did not want to do like worship leading as my job. And I think some of that was like this uh, young musician, like arrogance of like, oh, worship music's kind of lame. I want to do like yeah. cool music. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's like, was like my mentality as like a kid. And, but it was something that I kind of naturally was still always like drawn to, or at least had the opportunities to do. And part of my story that I always share with people is that, uh, I just kept doing it because it was like in front of me and the Lord honestly like really changed my heart towards worship later on in life. I was like in my mid twenties, wow. I'd already been on staff at Elevation for a few years before I really even like made like that like heart connection of like, man, this is actually what I'm designed to do. This isn't just like a means to an end to be able to write songs or produce albums or, or still do music. Like I was like created for the path of like being a worship leader and felt that when I felt that like calling, you know, that's like a church word, but that's yeah. like uh, anointing mm -hmm. that like changed the whole way that I approached leading worship. And it changed kind of the direction of like what I cared the most about. And so for me, I'm still a songwriter. I still love to produce music. I like to be in the studio. I like to do all those things. But when I'm on stage leading worship or if I'm in a room leading worship, that's where I feel the most fulfillment of like I'm walking in my gifting. That's amazing. I think um, in today's world, just post COVID, I think about, you know, people having those gifts and they're in that bubble of this is my gift, but how do I use, how do I make it and how, how do I get that career opportunity to use my gift or figure out where this place, especially if you're a creative, I feel yeah. like it gets more and more challenging to find places that let you do multiple things. So you really can find what you're passionate about and, and find a place to sit in it. How old were you when you felt that like, okay, this just went from, you know, I may be too cool to be the worship leader. I don't want to be that because right. that's how I see it from a from a younger age, which growing up in church, I can completely un understand seeing that. But what age were you where you were like, no, like this is what I'm this is my calling. This is what I'm called to do. Yeah, I think it's so funny. I'm I'm a big planner. I like to have my goals li lined out. I like to have all that stuff. Me and my wife are both like type A personalities in that sense. But when I look at just kind of like the arch of my life so much of like the journey that I've been on hasn't been planned and hasn't been scripted or been like on like a vision board or anything yeah. like that it's it's just been walking in what's in front of me and and taking seriously like what's in front of me and that's what's led to the next thing or the next thing and so even for most creatives or people that are trying to figure out you know trying to figure out what am I going to do with my life biggest thing that I always encourage people is one like do it as much as you can you know find up if you're a musician find every opportunity you can to play in front of people or if you're a worship leader to lead at 
small Bible studies or FCAs or whatever it might yep. be, but like find everything that you can to like just to do that thing. And I think that ultimately uh, that's where like opportunity comes about, yeah. you know? And so for me, I just kind of always did it. And like I said, like what was, what was in front of me, whether it was like a college ministry or whether it was my dad's student ministry, you know, the youth group where I'm just like leading with high school students and middle school students and trying to help them, like whatever it was in front of me, I just tried to do that well. Well, it sounds interesting because you were saying earlier, if you say, say a lot to the little yeses and yep. showing up, the then, showing up, then those doors open. How do you stay motivated through and this, the seasons of life, right? And then the transitions of life and then using that, your, your gifts and your skills, like how, what are some tips and like, how do you really stay motivated in that? Man, I think one, I think acknowledging that you're not always going to be motivated yes. <laughs> is key, Good point. especially as a creative. I had a mentor that I was venting to one time and I was like, man, I feel like every song I write sucks. And I feel like I'm like in a, <laughs> just a slump or whatever. And he gave me some very depressing advice where he said, yeah, that's never going to go away. <laughs> Th those feelings uh, yeah. are never going to go away. As a creative, you're always going to go through the cycle of like, oh, I'm crushing it. I love this song or I love this thing that I'm doing. Oh, wait, no, I hate this thing. I don't like it at all. Yeah. You know, like there's always that cycle that I think we naturally will go through. And that's a little bit like I feel like that's like life. You yeah. know, is you have good seasons, you have bad seasons. And I think like acknowledging, acknowledging that is so helpful already. Um, but then just choosing to still do it regardless. Uh, like one of the things I was, I was thinking about, uh, like being a creative, even in, uh, what's a comparison to like a fitness thing? you know, or a comparison to well, like, like a coach, you I mean, know, a coach creating and programming yeah. and workouts and they have to bring, I mean, they've created an experience. Is I think minutes, that sometimes right? we get in this zone of like the motivation factor or like, well, am I inspired? Am I inspired today mm -hmm. to go to the gym? Am I inspired yeah. today to work on this plan? And I think acknowledging that you got to do it even if you don't feel inspired. That's the way I have to approach songwriting. Like if I waited until I was inspired to sit down and write a song, I would never get anything done. But but I choose, all right, I'm gonna put on the calendar tomorrow at 12, I'm gonna call a buddy of mine, we're gonna write a song. And we're gonna sit down and do it whether we feel like inspired or not. And sometimes you're gonna come away with uh, stuff that's not very good, but sometimes you're gonna come away with like gold. And I think it's just showing up and doing it is, is such the key, you know? And not waiting not waiting for inspiration to hit to say yes or to say like I'm going to do this. Sometimes like you just got to say like, you're not always going to be motivated, but you just got to be disciplined. Put it on the calendar. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have to be motivated as much as you have to be like it's a discipline thing and that's I think how you move forward. Mm. What do you what do you love most about because there's different components of what you do, right? There's the songwriting, there's yeah. the performance side. And when you just said that it just rang a bell because as a coach, like someone who 10 years ago you know really started I was coaching gosh like eight sessions nine sessions a day yeah and so but it was that same thing is you know we talk about the ripple effect and you just never know the life that you're going to impact in that moment and I think as a worship leader it's probably very similar you wake up you're uninspired but you impact that one life that's going to go impact yeah another generation right it's the same thing in coaching right how do you show up consistently for that and and is that to me that that is a good parallel but I think for any of our coaches in our system listening to this it is a a, a great parallel to, yeah. to what that looks like yeah y'all have a coach one of the guys at ISI Matthews yep. named Kyle yeah Kyle Knox he's awesome and you know even him like posting on Instagram thing that he's always talking about is like the daily deposits like even if it's a small deposit what is the daily thing that like you're doing? And I do think that that's, that's just such an important mentality. Cause for me, you know, I'll be on tour and you're on like night 19 of the tour. You're doing the same set every night. Sometimes like it does feel draining and it feels like, 
okay, I miss my family. It's the same. Every day is the same. Like it, it can feel kind of that weight of the monotony. But when I switch the perspective of like, all right, it might be night 19 for me, but it's night one for yeah, the audience. The, yeah. the audience. It's night one for it's the one night that they're going to show up to kind of experience this worship night or this, you know, concert, whatever it might be. And it's the same way uh, when I show up on a Sunday morning to lead at, a, at church, you know, just like a normal church, the third worship experience of the day. Like that's that person who's in the congregation or in the audience. That's their one time of like, all right, I'm going to focus my attention on Jesus. I'm going to like really put all of my focus on him. And, and God has allowed me, he's given me the uh, authority to like steward that moment. So I take that very seriously, you know, wow. like that's a high calling. And I think as a coach, as a trainer, like if you can switch that perspective of not like how this affects you, <laughs> how this, you know, that you're depositing into other people and, and what your calling is to like serve other people. I think that really changes how you motivate yourself and how you stay inspired. And I think too, for, so my, my big takeaway from everything you just said, and that, that no matter what career you're in, I, you could be a stay at home mom, this is very relevant, is a lot of people have these goals, these visions of where they wanna go, whether it's, you know, you, you wanna be a CEO, or you wanna be a business owner, or you wanna be uh, a celebrity, like whatever it is, right, that is for you, is that you've gotta show up it's the old saying like god can't trust if god can't trust you with a dollar how's he going to trust you with a million dollars or if he can't trust you with five people how's he going to trust you with five thousand people yeah and so i think that to me one of the biggest keys of success is the most successful people in the world show up the same whether there's five people there or there's fifty thousand people there and yeah it's it's just showing up and understanding and acknowledging like hey the ripple effect of what can happen but you have to like you can't I always say like today, like our vision is is to be at 400 locations. Like I'm not the leader or the person I am to run that today. Right. But if I continue to show up, I will develop into that. Um, so I, I, to me, it's just that's a, a huge takeaway. Um, and I think it's that. awesome too. even the heart behind like like when you get down to it, like the heart behind a coach or the heart behind like a worship leader is to serve others. Right. And that's what life that's what makes life sweet. You know, if we spend all of our life trying to serve ourselves and what are like what's my biggest takeaway, what's my biggest goal, that's just an empty life. But if we just switch our perspective and like you're you're depositing into other people and you're helping mm-hmm. other people, that fills you up in like a different way. Yeah. That's awesome. I always say you give you give what you want to receive and that's really true. You know, when you flip into that servant mode and even if you're doing things yeah. that maybe you didn't imagine yourself doing at times because you need to step in and be that person it's amazing how that comes back to you tenfold um even if it's performing and showing up for five people when you thought there would yeah. be more there yep. you know um that's powerful yeah those um, 5 a.m sessions yeah <laughs> <laughs> sorry to get up for that it is so let, let's talk about your most recent song it is actually funny because w- one of our from the very beginning and you could go back on facebook i don't even think i had an instagram but that was my saying was the best is yet to come and i think i actually got it from new spring church yeah which is one of their core values but it, it, it's true it's this level of hope and that's your your newest single so talk to us a little bit about and it's with pat barrett but what inspired that song and, and what does the best is yet to come mean to you yeah i think uh I'm somebody that likes to look back and see, kind of celebrate victories and celebrate like, man, look at what happened here. You know, reminisce, nostalgia, all that stuff. But if you get, um, sometimes you can get in that mindset where you look back and you're like, shoot, was my mountaintop, like I'm already on my way downhill. (laughs) Like, did I, did I, did I hit my peak? Am I done? Is it all downhill from here? And and I think I would, I just, when I look at my life and I look at all the seasons, ups and downs, I've just continued to see how the Lord continues to like show up for me, for my family. 
and he's never like honestly when i look at my life it always has felt like up and to the right you know even mm-hmm. if it's a small thing and it's right. never like a, a spike usually it's usually just like a gradual like climb and it's just a reminder that no matter what season you're in when you are aligned for with jesus mm-hmm. when you're aligned with like his calling on your life you can trust that like better days are coming yeah and a lot of times it doesn't look like what you thought it was going to look like a lot of times it's it's very different than what you thought it was going to be but you can at least like trust and have that peace you know we talked about having that peace when you're being obedient right even if it's scary uh you can have that peace that like man better days are coming you know the best is always ahead when you're aligned with the Lord, you know, that's what, that's what me and my wife believe. And that's kind of what we have to remind ourselves. I feel like it's a song that I have to preach to myself just as much as I'm like trying to encourage other people. I'm like, okay, this is true. You know? So where did, so where did you guys, where did you write the song? We wrote this song. Was there like an aha moment? No, this is one of those songs, like some songs you write and in like an hour, you're like, we're done. The song rules. Let's track it. This song was like, I went down to Atlanta uh, to write with Pat. We had a couple of other friends with us. And it was one of those songs where we wrote it. We're like, okay, this is cool. Then like six months later, we're like, hey, let's, we need to rewrite this song because it's not that good. And then six months after that, we're like, hey, let's rewrite it again. <laughs> <laughs> and so this song went through so many different iterations and versions. Uh, it was just a long process. That's awesome. It is awesome, but it's very annoying too. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm <laughs> sure you have. I'd much rather the song just kind of come quickly. Is there one of those though that, one of the songs that you have written that was just like a, a um, call it like a an idea in the shower and it's like boom? And is it, it, it one of those songs a, a very well known song? Um, I would say most most of the songs <laughs> that I've written have been those like long journey songs. Okay. For the most part. Yeah. And and like uh, even going back to saying like sometimes you just got to put it on the calendar and just yep. like do it. A lot of the songs that I'm a part of have been out of like we're setting up like a writing retreat. Yep. And we're going to go away for like three days and we're just going to hunker down and, and try to bust out some songs, as many songs as we can. And that's been the best model for success for me is like like I said, putting it on the calendar, going away, doing it, and then being committed to the process of it. You know, yeah. as a songwriter, um, there's another songwriter in the church named Brian Johnson, and he he shared this a long time ago, and it's always stuck with me. He was like, he said, you're always going to have like a voice in your head telling you, is this song good or is it bad? And you got to listen to that voice because if you have that doubt, then it's probably like, okay, I need to, st- like it could I need be to keep, yeah, I need like to keep, keep digging. It. Even yesterday I was, I was writing a song with some friends and it's a song that we started probably a year and a half ago. And I just knew we're not done yet and we could be done. We could just like mail it in right. and be like, all right, let's, let's track it. But I felt like, no, we need to revisit this chorus. And so we spent two hours yesterday hammering it down and now i feel like the song is done it's so interesting i, I was listening to a podcast on uh is i think it was ed milet's podcast with brett eldridge okay and he was talking about how he he wrote an entire album he's like it was good but he's like i just knew there was a level deeper that i had to go and so he didn't do any of the songs completely rewrote the album and he's like and it's completely different style of his music t- too so it's very very um like it's, it's deep. It's almost depressing. <laughs> but it was kind of the season of life that he was in. And so before we, we wrap up here, I want to ask you, like, how much is it when you're writing a song and you talk about authenticity, how much is it about you versus your audience? Like, are you thinking of your audience when you're writing a song or are you thinking of things that are just relevant to your life? Like, especially in ministry, right? Because it's right. a little bit different. Yeah, that's a great question because I, I do think it's both. Okay. Um, because as a as a worship songwriter, yep. I'm always thinking about the church, and yeah. so how is this room? How is this song going to feel in a room full of people 
are they going to want to sing these words? Right. At the same time, yeah, I want it. It's got to be real to me, and it's got to be something that, like, means that's, like, true to me. Yeah. Uh, and so that's always on my mind, the corporate, you know, congregation mentality. And so balancing that of, like, uh, what's authentic to, like, what's the Lord teaching me? And a, a lot of times I will say that I, I feel like there's a lot of overlap that I think the things that I'm struggling with or the things that I'm uh, going through in my own life probably translates to a lot of people, <laughs> you right. know? And so a lot of people can connect to that same heart or that yeah. same like mentality. That's cool. Well, this has been great. This I'm so excited. Thanks for being here. Um, and it's really great to hear your story. And um, I'm going to wrap us up. But before I do, I want to let our listeners know um, how they can follow you through social platforms. So they can follow you on Instagram. Instagram, Spotify. At Matt Brock. And um, we'll link it um, okay. in the post. So people will be able to get all the links to you. Um, but thanks for coming today. Um, I think your story is so inspiring and I'm sure there's so many that are, whether it's in worship or music or other forms of creative, um, there's so many things they can take away from this. Um, and I think, uh, for me personally, it's one thing that you said today and I'll end on this was just talking about the areas that your life has gone and that it doesn't look how you maybe thought it would being type A and setting those things out. And I think that's one thing that, you know, I take away through life is that sometimes the more you try to control it and put those things in place, um, the harder it gets to really jump into that calling um, and where you see it. So um, for, for you even mentioning that and some of the tools that you gave and how you stay disciplined sometimes when you don't always feel motivated and knowing that's gonna be the case, um, I think is very powerful. I just wanna say how much of a fan I am of you guys big fan of isi oh. and just the community that y'all built has Thank been you. like that's one of the even as like a traveling musician like staying on top of all that stuff is really hard <laughs> it's hard imagine. to get in those you know that consistency and that kind of grind but the community that y'all built the way that y'all have set it up is awesome it's been like the best thing that i've been a part of so i appreciate you guys that's awesome thank you matt Thanks, man. All right, so the purpose of this podcast is to bring value to our audience on all aspects of what it means to train for life, both personally and professionally. As always, be sure to follow us and subscribe and share this episode with a friend and leave a review. We'll see you on the turf.